All righty. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Marshall W. Allred Planetarium. My name is Brandon. I'm a student worker here at UMD, and it is my wonderful job to help around this awesome place. Out there in the back, we have our director, Jessica. Can I give Jessica a hand, please? She's the one who will actually be doing your show tonight. I'm going to be the one watching comments since this is also a live stream show from our Facebook channel as well. Out in the hallway, you guys know the student worker of ours. That's Clayton. He was the one handing you all out tickets. And we have a wonderful show for you guys tonight. That's going to be exploring the gene in the sky. And that's basically all it's going to be. It's going to be looking at a bunch of constellations so we can see the gene in the sky, how to find them, and their stories. Um, other than that, that's really all I have for you. There's a little bit of safety, a couple of safety announcements. That's just going to be a, it's quite dark in here sometimes. So you've got to wrap some keys at any point during the show. You can exit through the entrance that you guys came in. We have a little bit of tape around the planetarium you guys need to observe. So you can use that to find your way out. But other than that, that's all I really have for you guys. I think we should get started. You ready, Jessica? Let's do it. Sweet. All right, I am getting our lights turned down and we are starting out looking at the sky for right now. It's this date, this time, looking up at the sky from here at the planetarium. Happy solstice, everyone. I almost forgot about that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, since it is the June solstice, which for us here in the Northern Hemisphere is our summer solstice, that means the sun reached the highest point in the sky for us throughout the year, and it also is out for the longest period of time. So this is our longest day of the year. Sadly, that does mean days will start getting shorter, but I'm okay with it. I'm also I'm, I'm good. We got a little while before we get back to the depressing 4 p.m. sunsets. Yeah, that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> but since it is the solstice right now, the sun is still up in the sky. So what we're going to first do is fast forward time to sunset. And you can see right at the front of the dome, there is the date and time. So you can keep track of kind of what we're looking at. We also have the cardinal directions up so you can know what part of the sky we're looking at. And just as the sun sets, if you look over to the west we find the moon with our nice little thin crescent. We just had our new moon, so we're starting a new phase cycle for our moon. And right next to the moon tonight is the evening star Venus. So not a star, but a planet. Um, and it is continuing to shine very brightly in our evening sky right after sunset. Um, so that first point of light you see over in the west, that's going to be Venus. But we can't see much else right now. So let's fast forward time a little bit more. So the sun gets lower. You can also see Venus and the moon are heading down towards the west following the sun. And as we get into twilight... Uh, we now also see, hanging out over there with Venus, is the planet Mars over in the west. So once it gets dark, you can see Mars over there as well. And yes, if you do notice, it has a slight red tinge to it. That is true. Mars is known as the red planet, and we can see that red from here on Earth, just looking with our eyes. Now, at this point in the night, I mean, it is pretty late. We're looking at like 10.40 p.m. Um, we are just starting to get dark enough to see the brightest stars and some planets in the sky. Um, but what I really want to do tonight is explore our true dark sky. So we're going to fast forward time even more until we get to the darkest that it can get. Which, because this is the longest amount of sunlight for the day of the year. Um, this is actually gonna take us just past midnight. So if you wanna get out to the truly dark sky, no hint of sun left, you're gonna have to stay up a little bit late. But all of the constellations I'm gonna show you and stars I'm gonna show you, you will be able to see 
a little bit earlier in the evening when it is first getting dark. I just, can you really beat these beautiful skies? I figured this was a you know, better, better way to view it and see it. All right, we are gonna get started looking at some of these patterns that we can see in the sky tonight. Um, these patterns are of course known as constellations. And uh, first up, over in the northwest, about halfway up the sky, we are going to look for seven bright stars that make up what's known as the Big Dipper. Now, I misled you a little bit because the Big Dipper is technically not a constellation. It's an asterism. So that means it's a smaller grouping of stars within a larger constellation, and that asterisms tend to be more recognizable than the constellation as a whole. Um, and so the Big Dipper here is really the seven brightest stars in the Greek constellation of Ursa Major, or the Big Bear. So to create the full bear, we have to add in some other stars. You can see those stars aren't quite as bright as the seven that make up the Dipper, which is why the Dipper is more easily recognizable. And uh, if you're having trouble turning this into a bear, it's not just you. Um, our bear here has a rather long tail for a bear. And a uh, cute little body though. Cute, cute little fuzzy bear bear. Um, now over here at Ursa Major, our big bear, there are a couple of things that I want to point out. And the first is this star here in the kind of crook of the bend in the tail or the bend in the handle of the dipper. This is a star named Miser, and to your eye, you may see a single star, or if you have really good vision, you might see there's also a second star there named Alcor. If you can't see that second star, I'm going to help you out. This is how it would look through a about six inch telescope. Um, so Miser and Alcor are what we call a double star system. So they're two stars that happen to look close to each other. They're not actually binary. They're not actually orbiting around each other, but they, from our point of view, appear very close together in the sky. And uh, this particular, particular duo um, is often known uh, among many different cultures as kind of a, a way of doing a vision check. Because if you can distinguish the two stars of Miser and Alcor, you have good vision. Um, so it's often a vision test. I read um, somewhere that it's also a test of age, because as you get older and your eyesight kind of depreciates a little bit and you can't see it anymore. Um, so that's a good test for you and your eyesight once you get out into those dark skies. Uh, another thing, right next to the tail of the bear, is an object known as Messier 101, or M101. It's also known as the Pinwheel Galaxy. And it is, in fact, a galaxy. Um, this is what we call a spiral disk galaxy. It's the same kind of galaxy that our Milky Way is, except the Pinwheel is a good bit bigger than our Milky Way. Um, not only is it bigger in diameter, it also has a lot more stars. Um, our Milky Way has a couple hundred billion stars. The Pinwheel, we estimate to have at least a trillion stars in it. Um, and if you have a pair of binoculars or a small telescope, this is a really fun, easy target to try and take a look at in the night sky. Um, again, this is a view through about a, a six or eight inch telescope here. You may not see quite as bright and quite as much detail because pictures are always going to get a little bit more detail than your eye can, um, but it will be nice and big in the eyepiece just like this. All right, moving on to our next set of stars, we're going to do some star hopping. So we're going to go back to our Big Dipper. And we're going to find those front two stars in the cup of the dipper. Those are our pointer stars. And we're going to follow them as they point us over 
to this star, which is named Polaris. Now, you may know Polaris as the North Star. Um, a lot of people know that Polaris or the North Star is important. Some people think that it must be the brightest star in the night sky in order to be important. That's not actually the case. Um, what makes Polaris so important is the fact, if I fast forward time here, you can see as the Earth rotates, all of the stars move across the sky except for Polaris. That's because our North Pole is pointed almost directly at it. And that causes everything to rotate around Polaris. I'm just going to hop us back to where we were before. Um, so since Polaris is always in the same spot, it's always north, it's great for navigation. Because if you can find the North Star, you know where north is, and therefore you know your other directions as well. Polaris will also help us find the Little Dipper. So just like the Big Dipper, there are seven stars that make up the Little Dipper. Um, Polaris and the two front stars in the cup of the Little Dipper are the three brightest. Those are typically what you'll see. To see the other four, you have to have really dark skies um, because they are quite dim. And uh, this is how you turn that into Ursa Minor, our little bear. Again, cute little fuzzy bear body, long, long bear tail. Now, both of these constellations are Greek, and there is a common joke that clearly the Greeks have never seen a bear before in their life. Um, we got to give them a little bit of credit. They do know what bears look like. Uh, so they actually had a story to explain why these bears have such long tails. And as many Greek stories do, this one starts off with Zeus. Zeus is the king of the Greek gods. He lives up on Mount Olympus with his wife Hera and all of the other gods and goddesses. And one day he decides to head down to Earth where he finds a village that's having a party. Um, at this party, he meets a woman named Callisto and they become real good friends. Such good friends that they have a son together named Arcus. Now you can imagine Zeus's wife Hera was not too happy about this. So to punish them, she turned Callisto into a bear. Years later, after Arcus had grown up some, he was out in the woods hunting and he came across this big bear that he didn't realize is his mom. Well, before anything bad could happen, Zeus had come back down to earth. He was checking on everyone and he explained to Arcus, hey, this is actually your mom. And he started to feel guilty so he decided to turn Arcus into a bear as well, and then put both of the bears in the night sky so that they can be safe and together forever. But to get them up there, he had to pick them up by those bear tails, spin them around, and fling them into the night sky. And it's that process of being spun and flung that stretched out those bear tails. And so that is why they have such unusually large tails. <laughs> All right, we have two more constellations here in the north that I want to point out. Um, first up, if you look over in the northeast, not too far above where you're seeing the time, uh, we can find a W in the sky. And that is the Greek constellation of the Queen Cassiopeia. Uh, now, turning a W into a queen takes a bit of imagination. Here's how this program does it. Uh, depending on which art you look at, you will see many different ways to try and interpret a W into a woman. Yeah, it's, it's just use your imagination. All right. Lastly, here in the north, I want to head back up to our two bears and take a look between our big bear and our little bear. You'll see a couple stars that snake upward. And if we follow them around, we end up following the tail and body of Draco the dragon. Mm -hmm. 
his tail starts off down there between the bears and then his head curves around back pointing south. And we'll talk more about Draco in a little bit. But that is our great dragon, Draco. All right. Um, so next up, I am going to turn us over to look at the western sky. Now, me turning the sky, this is the same as if you were to just stand up and kind of turn around, um, but I don't want to ask you to do that. I could turn the sky for us, so I did it. And now over here in the west, we're going to do a little bit more star hopping. We're going to go back to our Big Bear and our Big Dipper, and this time we're going to follow the handle of the Big Dipper. You'll notice it's curved or arced. What we're going to do is we're going to follow the arc of the handle as we arc to this star named Arcturus. Now Arcturus is the bottom point of what most people say looks kind of like this, this weird pointy thing. Um, I got a little ahead of myself with that sentence. <laughs> Some people say it looks like a kite. Uh, I see an ice cream cone. There it goes. Personally, like, I'm team kite. I think it looks more like a kite, personally. I, I, got, I gotta go team ice cream. I love ice cream. Mm -hmm. um, but would you believe it that uh, this kite ice cream thing is supposed to be a man? This is the, uh, this is Bootes. He is the herdsman or the cow herd, not cow, bear herder, um, who herds our little and big bear across the sky. Now, if you thought turning a W into a woman was difficult, I'm still trying to figure out how we get a kite into a man. I mean, this does a decent job of it. It's still weird. Um, number one lesson that we love teaching, constellations often do not look the way they're supposed to. Quote, unquote, supposed to. Especially, especially in Greece. There, <laughs> there's specifically one in the fall and one in the winter that come to mind. You know the constellation of Pegasus <laughs> or the constellation of Canis Minor, the little dog? You know what I mean? And if you don't, you'll just have to come back and see yeah. us then. Yeah. <laughs> All right, um, one more bit of star hopping from here. Uh, next thing we're gonna do, starting at Arcturus, we are going to spike down to this bright star aptly named Spica. And Spica is the brightest star in Virgo the Maiden. She has a pretty big constellation sprawling across the sky. Um, Virgo, her name is actually Persephone. Uh, she is the daughter of the goddess Demeter, who is the goddess of the harvest. So one of the things she can do is kind of help control the weather so she can grow crops and stuff. Um, and Persephone is a beautiful woman. Uh, so much that uh, when Hades sees her for the first time, he instantly falls in love with her and decides that she must be his queen. And instead of courting her like a normal person, he plants a flower that attracts her over to it. And when she bends down to sniff the flower, the earth opens up underneath her and she falls down into the underworld where she is now trapped. Um, now, when her mother hears about this, she is furious, storms down to the underworld, confronts Hades. They argue back and forth as she tries to get her daughter back. In the meantime, um, Persephone starts getting a little peckish and finds a pomegranate and decides to eat a pomegranate. Now, the moment she eats just a single pomegranate seed, her fate is sealed. Because to the Greeks, where you eat is your home. So by eating even just a single pomegranate seed, she had made the underworld her home. And therefore, she couldn't leave. Demeter wouldn't accept this, though, so she got Zeus involved, who ended up reaching a compromise between the two. Uh, for six months of the year, Persephone would be up on Earth with her mother, 
and for six months of the year, she would be down in the underworld with Hades. So for the six months that we see Persephone up in our night sky, that's when she's up on Earth with her mom. Her mom is happy, and since she controls the weather, when she's happy, we get nice happy weather. Then for the six months that we do not see Persephone in our night sky, that's when she's down in the underworld, Demeter is upset, and we get bad weather. And with that, um, the Greeks explain seasonal weather patterns with the story of Persephone. All right, I'm gonna give us another quick turn over to the south. Because uh, we are going to look at our last few uh, spring constellations and some summer constellations that are visible over in the south. So if you turn your attention back up to Arcturus and Bootes, right next to Bootes, you'll see a U-shape. This is Corona Borealis, or the Northern Crown. One of the few constellations that doesn't take much imagination to see. I like this one. Now, right next to our crown, we have one of our night sky heroes, Hercules. <laughs> We're being nice, Brayden. <laughs> um, so, Hercules is a demigod. He's half god, half human. Being half god, he ends up with some powers. In the case of Hercules, he has super strength. Now, being super strong half god, um, this makes people kind of afraid of him. And he doesn't like that. He wants people to like him. So he ends up talking to a king who tells him to complete these 12 tasks, which we now know as the 12 labors of Hercules. Um, and they say that if he completes these 12 tasks, he'll prove that he's a good person and people will like him. Well, you'll notice way overhead as we look at Hercules, he is stomping down on the head of Draco the dragon. Because we're seeing one of, those, uh, one of those tasks, one of those labors being completed. Uh, Draco, some people say represents the dragon, I think it's Leiden? think so. Um, who guards a tree that grows golden apples. And one of Hercules' tasks is to retrieve the apples from this tree. Um, but in order to do that, he has to defeat Draco. So we see the battle taking place as Hercules fights Draco uh, in order to get to that tree, get those apples, and complete one of the trials. Now, there are lots of other constellations that are associated with Hercules and his 12 labors, um, and they are up all throughout the year. So if you want to learn more about them, another reason to come back and see us so you can learn more of these. Uh, now, before we head on to our next constellation, one thing I want to point out. Right in Hercules' side is an object called M13 or Messier 13. Uh, this is the great globular cluster of Hercules. And it looks something like this. Um, a globular cluster is a huge collection of stars. Um, we're talking tens to hundreds of thousands of stars. And these stars are packed in really close together in a roughly kind of spherical distribution. And when you see that through a telescope, you see all of these stars that kind of look like they're shimmering because of the motions in our atmosphere, and it kind of makes it almost glisten. Um, I, a lot of people just describe it as like looking at kind of glittering jewels. Um, I think when we looked at this one over the summer last year, um, my students said it looks like a puff of glitter in the eyepiece of the telescope. Um, but this is one of my personal favorite summer objects to try and look at. And you can do it with a pair of binoculars or a small telescope, and you can see the great globular cluster of Hercules. All right. Now, just 
below Hercules, so if we look down towards the south, you will see, where's my button? There it is, um, a bright red star. This is the star Antares. And you may notice that it's the top of what kind of looks like a hook, hooking down to the southern horizon. Um, if anyone here has seen Moana, I don't know if you haven't, you should. I don't care how old you are, it's amazing. Um, one of the things they talk about in the movie is how the Polynesians used um, a constellation they called Ma Maui's Hook to help them navigate. This is it. This is Maui's Hook that the Polynesians used to navigate the seas. Um, to the Greeks, though, this hook was part of another constellation, which we know of as Scorpius, the Scorpion. So we add kind of some stars more to the right of Antares to create kind of the head and the pincers, where the hook is the body and the curved tail of the scorpion. All right. Now, just to the left, so more to the southeast, right above where we have the date, you will see what we affectionately refer to as the teapot. And it looks very much like a teapot, right? You got the little top and the, the handle and the spout coming off the side. And uh, if you notice the kind of fuzzy arch in the sky, that's our Milky Way galaxy. You can think of that as like the steam coming out of the teapot. Um, the teapot is another asterism, um, which is supposed to be Sagittarius who is a centaur? I mean, I don't know. turn a teapot into a centaur. I guess. Please, someone show me how. I mean, I guess this is showing how, kind of, but I, I don't fully buy it. I, um, <laughs> I prefer the teapot, because that looks exactly what it sounds like. Um, now, between Sagittarius and Scorpius, again, we have that fuzzy band running through, that's our Milky Way galaxy. And in fact, the part of the galaxy right next to Sagittarius is the center of our galaxy. And that's why the summer Milky Way tends to be an absolute brilliant sight, because you're looking into the center of our galaxy where most of the stars and gas clouds are, and you get extraordinary views of our galaxy. And if you point binoculars or a telescope anywhere in this region, you're going to see so many different things. All right, to finish us up, I'm going to take us over to the east for our last three constellations. Um, probably the most prominent thing you'll see up in the summer sky are these three bright stars in the east, which are known as the Summer Triangle. We have Vega, Deneb, and Altair make up the Summer Triangle stretching across the Milky Way. And each of these stars is a part of their own constellation. Vega is the brightest in Lyra the Lyre, or Lyra the Harp. Brayden's here, so I have to say Lyre. Um, <laughs> he's a music education uh, major and yeah. gets very passionate about the difference between a lyre and a harp. Well, a lyre is an ancient, is a basically an ancient string instrument. So basic, so essentially you just think of a, a, a small harp, essentially. If you've seen art of such, of, of Greek uh, characters such as Apollo or Orpheus, um, the instrument that they play is actually the exact instrument that is in our night sky. Yep, right there. That's that's the lyre. Um, down to Altair. Um, it is the brightest star in Achilla the Eagle, which in this form looks a lot more like a stingray. Um, <laughs> yeah. But here is Achilla the Eagle. Um, and this art we're seeing him carrying someone, um, probably Aquarius, um, 
Achilla was kind of a, a messenger for Zeus, and he did a lot of different tasks for him. Uh, and that's why he's up in the sky as kind of a thank you for the millions of errands that he ran for Zeus. Uh, and then our third star of the summer triangle, Deneb, is a part of another bird. We have Cygnus the swan, uh, which does look very swan-like, right? We have our nice wide wings, our long swan neck, very, very bird-like. And that is our summer triangle. Now, there are a few more things to see, but we are out of time. Um, so as just a very quick, there are some other cool things that you can see up, like the ring nebula, which is found up in Lyra, or the dumbbell nebula. Oops, where'd it go? This way. Wrong button which is found between Achilla and Cygnus. Um, but from here, because we are at the end of our half hour, I am going to fast forward time on some more. As the earth rotates, we can again see the stars moving across the sky. And as we get a bit later into the night, we get a few more planets, Saturn becomes visible, and Jupiter. Uranus and Neptune are also up there, but you have to have a telescope to be able to see those. And hanging out right next to the sun is Mercury. We're about past optimal viewing for Mercury as it's heading back to the sun, um, but in uh, several weeks, it'll pop back out in the evening sky and we'll be able to see it again. And that brings us back to the day and to the end of our exploration of our June sky. Um, so before you head out, if you haven't already, um, there are some star charts next to the TV um, out at the front entrance. Uh, feel free to take one of those with you. Um, it shows the stars and constellations we talked about here tonight, as well as a few others. Um, Brittany and I will be here if you have any questions. Otherwise, thank you all so much for coming. Um, if you are in the Duluth area next week after the show, we're going to have some telescope viewing. So you can come back and see us next week as well um, and for a new show as well. Um, so again, thank you for coming. Uh, have a wonderful rest of your evening, Emily. Give me one sec to close up the stream. <laughs>